Welcome to the Acela HHT8 High Speed Electric Locomotive. The other electric trains you can drive in Train Simulator are the Acela Express, the Series 7000 LSE, and the Series 2000. I'm using the Acela HHP8 to teach you about electric locomotives, but remember that each electric locomotive is different. In this lesson, I'll walk you through each of the main controls and gauges and show you how to start this train moving. As in all the tutorials in Train Simulator, I'll lock out the controls we're not using so we can focus on the task at hand. Let's get started. First, let's change to an external view so we can see the train from the outside. Follow the instructions written on the screen to change to external view one. Well done. The electric trains in Train Simulator get their power from overhead lines called the catenary. You can see the lines over the tracks. Let's move the camera a bit to get a closer look. First, let's spin the camera around. Now let's zoom in for a closer look. In order to get power from the lines, we need to raise the pantograph. The pantographs are the red metal bars on the roof of the locomotive. Raise the pantograph now. Great. Notice that only the rear pantograph was raised. If we were headed in the opposite direction, the other pantograph would have been raised because the trailing, or rear pantograph, is always used. You'll find that the pantograph has already been raised when you start most activities in Train Simulator, just as it would be in the real world. Let's go back inside the locomotive now. The engineer, who operates the train, sits in the cab of the locomotive. Take a moment to look left and right, but then come back to this central view, which is the view you'll use to move the locomotive's controls. You can see that there are quite a few controls in this locomotive. Today, we're going to focus on the most important ones. This control is the reverser. I've drawn a box around it. The reverser has three settings, forward, reverse, and neutral. Try moving the reverser to its forward position now. Great. Now, let's look at a few more basic controls. This control is the throttle. It sets your speed. Some locomotives have throttles with set notches. Others, like this one, allow you to move the throttle continuously. Don't move the throttle now. We'll use it a bit later in this lesson. This is the speedometer. Some locomotives have analog speedometers with needles on their dials. Others have digital speed readouts. And some, like this Acela HHP8 locomotive, have both. Next, let's talk about the brakes. This locomotive has two brake handles, one for the whole train and one just for the locomotive. Let's look at the train brakes first. This is the train brake handle. You use it to apply and release the brakes on the whole train. This is the locomotive brake handle. You use it to apply and release brakes only on the locomotive. The Acela HHP8 is the only electric train in Train Simulator with a locomotive brake, because the other electric locomotives are permanently coupled to their passenger cars. These are the air brake gauges. For detailed information about reading the gauges, refer to the help system. Here's a quick tip. The red brake cylinder needle on the right-hand dial shows how much brake pressure is being applied to the wheels. If it's at zero, the brakes are off. Let's try out the horn. Notice that the bell rings when you sound the horn and doesn't stop ringing. You'll need to turn the bell off by pressing the bell button. Good. When you approach a passenger platform, you need to keep the bell ringing until you've come to a stop. The best way to do that is to sound the horn on approach and then let the bell continue to ring. Bells are used only on U.S. locomotives. This button controls the sander. You can drop sand onto the track to help the wheels grip the rails and prevent the wheels from slipping. Remember that there is a limited amount of sand on board the locomotive, 
so don't forget to turn the sander off. All these controls, gauges, and key commands can be confusing, and you'll have lots more information to keep track of when you're trying to meet a timetable. To keep your important information organized, we've provided an operations notebook. Let's look at it now. Take a moment to look at each of the tabs. The operations notebook contains all the information you need to complete a run. You'll be referring to it often. Now let's close the operations notebook and look at one of the other driving aids provided in Train Simulator. Once you've opened a driving aid window, you can close it again by pressing the same key command that opened it, or you can click the X in the upper right corner of the driving aid window. You may have noticed that the operations notebook contains the entire timetable for your run. Another way to access the timetable is in the next station driving aid. It shows just the station you are currently in or have just left and the next station. Let's have a look. Excellent. Note that our timetable shows departure from the station at 10.05 a.m., so we have only a few moments to wait. You'll hear the conductor say, OK to proceed when the train has permission to depart. Do not move the train before you receive permission. Close the next station driving aid so you can see the cab controls better. To close the driving aid, press the same key you used to open it or click the X in the upper right corner. OK to proceed. That's the signal. Now we can depart. Now completely release the train brake. It controls the brakes on both the locomotive and the passenger cars. Make sure to move the handle all the way to the release position. On the computer display above the brake handle, you will see the yellow All Applied sign change to a gray All Released sign when the brakes are completely released. Okay, we're ready to move the train. Now, move the throttle away from you to start the train moving. And we're moving. Well done. This aerodynamic train is built for coasting. Once you get up to speed, you can move the throttle back to zero and then increase the throttle only as necessary to maintain speed. Excellent work. That's all for this lesson. You've learned about the most important controls and features of the electric locomotives in Train Simulator. And, of course, you know how to start the train moving. It's important for you to understand about passenger operations, speed limits, and rail safety if you want to make the most of Train Simulator. And there are additional controls, views, and driving aids not covered in this lesson. You can get more information about all these topics in the Engineer's Handbook and in the Help System which is displayed when you press F1.
Electric Dash 9-44CW, commonly known as the Dash 9. The other diesel locomotives you can drive in Train Simulator are the GP38-2 and the Keyhaw 31. I'll use the Dash 9 to teach you about diesel locomotives. But remember that each locomotive is different. In particular, not all diesel locomotives are as highly computerized as the Dash 9. In this lesson, I'll walk you through each of the main controls and gauges and show you how to start this train moving. As in all the tutorials in Train Simulator, I'll lock out the controls we're not using so we can focus on the task at hand. Let's get started. First, let's change to an external view so we can see the train from the outside. Follow the instructions written on the screen to change to external view 1. Well done! The Dash 9 is a diesel electric locomotive commonly used for hauling freight. It weighs almost 200 tons and can provide a pulling force of up to 142,000 pounds. Now let's move the camera a bit to get a closer look. Let's go back inside the locomotive now. The engineer sits in the cab. Excellent. Take a moment to look left and right, but then come back to the central view, which is the view you use to move the locomotive's controls. The engine is already started, so the first thing to do is set the direction of movement of the train. You do that with the reverser. The reverser has three settings, forward, reverse, and neutral. Try moving the reverser to its forward position now. You can see the reverser setting on the reverser display in the computer screen. Great! Now let's look at a few more basic controls. This control is the throttle. It sets your speed. On this locomotive, pulling the throttle towards you increases the speed. Don't move the throttle now. We'll use it a bit later in this lesson. On this locomotive, the same handle that controls the throttle also controls the dynamic brakes. That's why it is called the combined power handle. You push the handle away from you to increase dynamic braking. Every time you change from adding power with the throttle to braking with the dynamic brakes, you must pause for a few seconds in the middle at the notch marked Setup. Remember to make small changes with your throttle, particularly when you are starting a train. Some locomotives have throttles with set notches. Others allow you to move the throttle continuously. This locomotive has a notch throttle, and you can see which notch you're using in the throttle display on the computer screen just above the throttle. We're currently in the idle notch. This is the speedometer. Some locomotives have analog speedometers with needles on their dials. Others have digital speed readouts. And some, like this Dash 9 locomotive, have both. Now let's talk about the brakes. This locomotive has two brake handles in addition to the combined power handle. One handle applies air brakes on the whole train. The other one applies air brakes only on the locomotive. Let's look at the train brakes first. This is the train brake handle. You use it to apply and release the brakes on the whole train. This is the locomotive brake handle. You use it to apply and release brakes only on the locomotive. These are the brake gauges. When you are pulling heavy freight trains in mountainous territory, such as on Marias Pass, you must be very aware of how much air pressure is available in the brake pipe and in each of the air reservoirs. For detailed information about reading the gauges, see the train simulator help system. The ammeter shows how much electrical current is being used in the traction motors when you apply the throttle or how much current is generated when you apply the dynamic brakes. 
During dynamic braking, the ammeter shows a negative reading. The train simulator help system explains how to use the ammeter to make decisions about throttle settings when you start a train moving. Now let's look at a few of the most important buttons in the cab. First, let's try out the horn. You'll hear the bell ring too. whenever the horn is sounded. You have to turn it off separately. Turn off the bell now. Excellent. This button controls the sander. You can drop sand onto the tracks to help the wheels grip the rails and prevent the wheels from slipping. Remember that there is a limited amount of sand on board the locomotive, so don't forget to turn the sander off. This is the alerter reset button. Only the American locomotives have these. The alerter system makes sure the engineer is alert. If you don't move any controls in the locomotive for 25 seconds, the alerter will sound and you'll see the word alerter on the screen. If this happens, press the alerter reset button. Otherwise, the train's brakes will be applied. In the real world, disabling this safety feature would be illegal. But in Train Simulator, if you prefer not to have the alerter system engaged, you can turn it off on the Options screen. See the Help System for instructions. Now we need to completely release the train's air brakes. Make sure to move the handle all the way towards you to the release position. Okay, we're ready to move the train. It's correct procedure to sound the horn before we move, to warn anyone around us. When you sound the horn, the bell will ring. Just leave it ringing for now. Use your horn to warn people and animals that you're approaching, or as a signal to your crew or to other trains. The help system explains various horn signals you can use. Now we're ready to move. To avoid breaking a coupler by putting too much run-out force on it, we'll start very slowly. The combined power handle is in the idle position now. Pulling it towards you accelerates. Pushing it away from you past idle begins dynamic braking. Pull it towards you now to the first notch, which is N1. That should be enough to get you started. And we're moving. Well done. Now that we're moving, you can turn off the bell. Bells are used only on the U.S. trains. Okay, now we need to keep moving slowly until we've picked up all the cars. If you want to, you can switch to external view two to watch the end of the train. Now that all the cars in the train are in motion, pull the combined power handle towards you one more notch to N2 so we pick up a little speed. Good. That's it. You've learned about the main controls and gauges in diesel locomotives, and you know how to start a diesel train moving. It's important for you to understand about freight operations, speed limits, rail safety, and managing slack in a freight train if you want to make the most of Train Simulator. And there are additional controls, views, and driving aids not covered in this lesson. You can get more information about all these topics in the Engineer's Handbook and in the Help System, which is displayed when you press F1.
Welcome to Flying Scotsman, the world's most famous steam locomotive. The other steam train you can drive in Train Simulator is the Gullsdorf 380. I'll use the Scotsman to teach you about steam locomotives, but remember that each locomotive is different. In this lesson, I'll walk you through each of the main controls and gauges. Then we'll move this train out of the station and onto the main line. As in all the tutorials in Train Simulator, I'll walk out the controls we're not using so we can focus on the task at hand. Now, let's get started. First, let's change to an external view so we can see the train from the outside. Follow the instructions written on the screen to change to external view 1. Well done. Let's move the camera a bit to get a closer look. Follow the directions written on the screen. She's a beauty, isn't she? Let's go back inside the locomotive now. The train driver, also known as the engineer, sits in the cab. Flying Scotsman is modeled as it was in the 1920s when the driver sat on the right. Take a moment to look left and right, then come back to this central view, which is the view you'll use to move the locomotive's controls. You can see that there are quite a few gauges and controls in this locomotive. Today we're going to focus on the most important ones. The reverser sets the direction of movement of the train. This is the reverser handle. You turn it to change the reverser setting, but don't turn it just yet, since we'll be standing in the station for a few more minutes. I've drawn a box around the reverser sector plate. It shows the current setting of the reverser. Notice that it's at zero. That means the locomotive is in neutral. It won't move backward or forward. When starting and stopping the train, use the reverser in its full open position with the sector plate reading close to full forward at the bottom of the sector plate or full backward at the top of the sector plate. Using the reverser in either of these full open positions is similar to a low gear. As the train gains momentum, move the reverser towards zero, similar to a high gear. This control is the regulator, which is the same thing as the throttle. It sets your speed. You pull it toward you to add power, or push it away from you to reduce power. Don't move the regulator now. We'll use it a bit later in this lesson. The regulator is similar to the accelerator in an automobile, and the reverser is similar to the transmission. We use the reverser and the regulator in coordination with each other. This is the speedometer. The Scotsman didn't have a speedometer in the 1920s, but we added this one to help you out. This is the boiler pressure gauge. It shows you how much steam pressure is in the boiler. The regulator and reverser we just looked at allow you to use the steam pressure to power the train. This is the steam chest pressure gauge. It measures the pressure of the steam in the cylinders, where the steam is used to move the wheels. There are three cylinders on the Scotsman, one on each side in front of the driving wheels, and a third cylinder underneath the locomotive. The regulator determines how much steam is sent to the cylinders, and the reverser determines how efficiently the steam is used. Let's talk about the brakes. This locomotive has vacuum brakes. You control the brakes with the large ejector handle. Move it up and the brakes will begin to be released. The higher you move it, the faster they will be released. Move it down past its center position and the brakes will be applied. Again, the further you push it, the faster they work. Returning the ejector handle to its center position keeps the brakes in their current position. For example, if the brakes are applied at half strength, returning the handle to the center will keep them at half strength.
The other steam locomotive and train simulator, the Goelsdorf 380, has air brakes instead of vacuum brakes. Although the braking system is different, you apply and release brakes the same way, with the brake handle. This is the brake gauge. Actually, it's two gauges in one. The gauge on the right is for the vacuum cylinder, and the gauge on the left is for the brake cylinder. If both gauges indicate the same pressure, the brakes are off. The bigger the difference between where the needles are pointing, the harder the brakes are being applied. The vacuum cylinder gauge on the right should always read 21. So if the brake cylinder gauge on the left also reads 21, the brakes are released. If the brake cylinder gauge reads anything lower than 18, the brakes are applied. The lower the number, the more the brake pressure is applied to the wheels. For detailed information about reading the gauges, see the train simulator help system by pressing the F1 key. Now, let's try out the whistle. Try sounding the whistle now. Great. Now, let's look at a few more basic controls. This lever controls the sander. You can drop sand onto the track to help the wheels grip the rails and prevent the wheels from slipping. If you know that the rails are slick, such as during a rain or snowstorm, you should use the sander before you move the train. This lever controls the cylinder cocks, which allow the steam cylinders to drain out any water that has accumulated while the locomotive is stopped. Open the cylinder cocks when the locomotive is at a stop to avoid steam and condensation accumulating in the cylinders. When you start up the locomotive after a stop, close the cylinder cocks after a few rotations of the wheels. If you are watching the train from an external view when the cylinder cocks are open, you'll see steam shooting out from the cylinders on the driving wheels as the train starts to move. You may be wondering how all this steam was created. That's the job of the fireman. If you want to be the fireman, the first thing to do is turn off the computer control fireman, which is on by default. I've already done it for you for this lesson. Usually you do that in the options screen before you start an activity. Your main job as fireman is to make steam. To do that, you need to tend the fire and the boiler. Let's talk about the fire first. This is the door to the fire box. Open the fire box door by following the directions on your screen, so we can have a look at the fire. You can check the heat of the fire by looking at its color. Orange is coolest, red is hotter, white is hottest. The heat of the fire determines how efficiently you use the coal. The hotter the fire, the more efficient it is. By burning coal efficiently, you'll make sure you have enough steam available when you need it, and enough coal available for the entire journey. You can add more coal to the fire by using a key command to shovel coal from the tender behind you into the firebox. Make sure the firebox door is open before you try to shovel. Shovel in some coal now. good work. You'll really have to put your back into it to keep the fire going strong on this one. Let's stop shoveling coal now so we can continue on this. The engineer's handbook and the help system contain lots of useful information about keeping your fire going nice and hot. You'll find information there about using the dampers, the firebox doors, and the blower to keep air moving through the fire. To see the effect of all your hard work, glance out the window at the smoke coming from the chimney. Let's take a look now using external view one. Watch the smoke lighten in color as the coal we just added begins to heat up and burn hot. In general, when you burn, the smoke should be very light gray. If it's dark, the coal isn't burning up sufficiently, so you need to make the fire hotter. If the smoke is clear, 
we need to add more coal. Let's go back into the cab to learn about your other major duty, keeping the boiler filled with the right amount of water. Keep an eye on the water level in your boiler. There are two water gauges. The one on the left shows the level in the boiler. When it gets low, below two-thirds full, add more water from the tender. Don't allow the boiler water to get too low, or you'll really have a problem on your hands, because the boiler could melt. If the water level gets dangerously low, your activity ends automatically. But don't fill it too full either, as that could cause priming, a condition in which water gets into the systems meant for steam. Priming can break the cylinders. You add water to the boiler using either of two injectors. To use the injectors, open one of the injector steam valves and its associated water valve. The injectors use steam to push water from the tender into the boiler. Make sure not to overfill the boiler. The water you put into the boiler came from the tender behind us. In train simulator, the tender water gauge is located next to the boiler water gauge. Keep an eye on the tender water gauge. If you're running low on water, fill up at a water trough or water tower. Instructions for filling the tender are included in the help system. Now, let's not forget why you're making a fire and adding water in the first place. To create steam. Your whole reason for being is to provide steam for the engineer to move the train. You measure the amount of steam available to the driver by looking at the boiler pressure gauge. As you learn the art of firing, watch the boiler pressure gauge when you add water to the boiler and when you add coal to the fire. You'll learn quickly how your changes affect the amount of steam pressure available to the engineer. If you provide too little steam, the engineer can't move the train. If you provide too much steam, the safety valves go off, causing an awful wreck. Wasting steam by blowing it out the safety valves is a waste of water and coal. So study your engineer's handbook and the on-screen help and practice your firing skills on short runs. You've been doing a bang-up job as firemen so far. As you can see, we've got plenty of steam pressure to move this train. All these controls, gauges, and key commands can be confusing. And you'll have lots more information to keep track of when you're trying to meet a timetable. To keep your important information organized, we provided an operations notebook. Let's look at it now. Take a moment to look at each tab. The operations notebook contains all the information you need to complete a run. You'll be referring to it often. Now let's close the operations notebook and look at one of the other driving aids provided in Train Simulator. Once you've opened the driving aid, you can close it again by pressing the same key command that opened it. You may have noticed that the operations notebook contains the entire timetable for your run. Another way to access the timetable is in the next station driving aid. It shows just the station you are currently in or have just left and the next station. Let's have a look. Excellent! Note that our timetable shows we have only a few moments before departure. You'll hear a loud whistle from the station master when the train has permission to depart. Do not move the train before you receive permission. Close the next station driving aid so you can see the cab controls better. That's the signal. We're ready to depart now. Close or move the next station driving aid so you can see the cab controls better. 
We'll start by moving the reverser to the forward position. About 65% ought to be just fine to start the train. Remember that you can see the reverser's position on the sector plate, which is the brass rectangle just in front of you. Flying Scotsman uses vacuum brakes. That is, a vacuum is maintained to hold the brake shoes off the wheels. You control the brakes with the large ejector handle. When you move it upwards, the brakes begin to be released. The higher you move it, the faster they will be released. Move it halfway up now. Good. Look at the brake pressure gauge. You'll see it has two needles. The one on the right shows how much vacuum there is in the cylinder. It should stay constant at 21 inches of mercury. The one on the left shows the current setting of the brakes. So the difference between the two is how much force is being applied. When the needle on the left has moved all the way to 21, there is no difference between the two needles, and the brakes are fully released. The brakes are now fully released. Move the brake handle back down to the center to hold that setting. Excellent. We're ready to move the train. Before we move off, we should sound the whistle to warn anyone near the train. Good. Remember to use your whistle when you move the train, when you enter a tunnel, or any other times you need to sound a warning. You'll find details about using the whistle in the engineer's handbook or in the help system. To move the train, pull the regulator toward you until the train starts moving. Your regulator works much like the accelerator in a car. Remember to use it gently to avoid disturbing the passengers. Now that we're moving, any water that's condensed in the cylinders will have been forced out, and we can close the cylinder cocks. Always remember to open the cylinder cocks before moving, and close them once you've started moving. Go ahead and switch to external view 1 to watch this beautiful train departing from the station. Good work. Remember, the reverser controls how efficiently you use power. When the train has plenty of momentum, you can move the reverser towards zero. When you need more pulling power, such as starting from a stop or heading up a hill, set the reverser towards its full forward or full backward position. Excellent work. That's all for this lesson. You've learned about the main controls and gauges in steam locomotives, and you know how to start a steam train moving. Remember, never depart from a station before receiving permission. It's important for you to understand about passenger operations, speed limits, and rail safety if you want to make the most of train simulator. And there are additional controls, views, and driving aids not covered in this lesson. You can get more information about all these topics in the engineer's handbook and in the help system, which is displayed when you press F1.